Well, Master, we're in a fix and no mistake, said Sam Gamgee. He stood despondently with hunched shoulders beside Frodo and peered out with puckered eyes into the gloom. It was the third evening since they had fled from the company. As far as they could tell, they had almost lost count of the hours during which they had climbed and labored among the barren slopes and stones of the Emin Muil, sometimes retracing their steps because they could find no way forward, sometimes discovering that they had wandered in a circle back to where they had been for hours before. Yet on the whole, they had worked steadily eastward, keeping as near as they could find a way to the outer edge of this strange twisted knot of hills. But always they found its outward faces sheer, high, and impassable, frowning over the plain below. Beyond its tumbled skirts lay livid festering marshes where nothing moved, and not even a bird was to be seen. The hobbits stood now in the brink of a tall cliff, bare and bleak, its feet wrapped in mist, and behind them rose the broken highlands, crowned with drifting cloud. A chill wind blew from the east. Night was gathering over shapeless lands before them. The sickly green of them was fading into a sullen brown. Far away to the right of the Anduin, that had gleamed fitfully in sunbreaks during the day, was now hidden in shadow. But their eyes did not look beyond the river, back to Gondor, to their friends, to the lands of men. South and east they stared to, where, at the edge of the oncoming night, a dark line hung, like distant mountains of motionless smoke. Every now and again, a tiny red gleam far away flickered upwards, on the rim of the earth and sky. What a fix, said Sam. That's the one place in all the lands we've heard of that we don't want to see any closer. And that's the one place we're trying to get to. And that's just what we can't get know-how. We've come the wrong way altogether, seemingly. We can't get down, and if we did get down, we'd find all that green land and nasty bog, I'll warrant. Whew! Can you smell it? He sniffed at the wind. Yes, I can smell it, said Frodo. But he did not move, and his eyes remained fixed, staring out towards the dark line and the flickering flame. He muttered under his breath. If I must go there, I wish I could come there quickly and make an end. He shuddered. The wind was chilly and yet heavy with an odor of cold decay. Well, he said at last, withdrawing his eyes, we cannot stay here all night. Fix or no fix, we must find a more sheltered spot and camp once more, and perhaps another day will show us a path. <laughs> or another and another and another muttered Sam. Or maybe no day. We've come the wrong way. I wonder, said Frodo, it's my doom, I think, to go to that shadow yonder, so that a way will be found. But will good or evil show it to me? What hope we had in speed. Delay plays into the enemy's hands, and here I am, delayed. Is it the will of the Dark Tower that steers us? All my choices have proven ill. I should have left the company long before, and come down to the north, east of the river and of the Emin Muil, and so over the hard battle plain to the passes of Mordor. But now it isn't possible for you and me alone to find a way back, and the orcs are prowling on the east bank. Every day that passes is a precious day lost. <laughs> I am tired, Sam. I, I don't know what is to be done. What food have you got left? Only those what you call them lembers, Mr. Frodo. A fair supply. But they're better than naught, by a long bite. I never thought, I thought, when I first set tooth in them, that I should never come to wish for a change. But I do now. A bit of plain bread and a mug. Aye, half a mug of beer would go down proper. I've lugged my cooking gear all the way from the last camp, and what use has it been? Not to make a fire with, for a start, and not to cook. Not even grass! They turned away and went down into a stony hollow. The westering wind was caught into clouds, 
and night came swiftly. They slept as well as they could for the cold turn and turn about in a nook amongst the great jagged pinnacles of weathered rock. At least they were sheltered from the easterly wind. Did you see them again, Mr. Frodo? Asked Sam as they sat, stiff and chilled, munching wafers of lembus in the cold grey of early morning. No, said Frodo. I've heard nothing and seen nothing for two nights now. Nor me, said Sam. Those eyes did give me a turn, but perhaps we've shaken them off at last. A miserable slinker. Gollum. I'll give him Gollum in his throat if ever I get my hands on his neck. I hope you'll never need to, said Frodo. I don't know if he followed us, but it may be that he has lost us again, as you say. In this dry, bleak land, we can't leave many footprints. Nor much scent, even for his snuffling nose. I hope that's the way of it, said Sam. I wish we could be rid of him for good. So do I, said Frodo. But he's not my chief trouble. I wish we could get away from these hills. I hate them. I feel all naked on the east side, stuck up here with nothing but the dead flats between me and the shadow yonder. There's an eye in it. Come on, we've got to get down today somehow. But that day wore on, and when afternoon faded towards evening, they were still scrambling along the ridge and had found no way of escape. Sometimes in the silence of that barren country, they fancied that they heard faint sounds behind them. A stone falling, or the imagined step of flapping feet on the rock. But if they halted and stood still listening, they heard no one. Nothing but the wind sighing over the edges of the stones. Yet even that reminded them of breath softly hissing through sharp teeth. All that day, the outer ridge of the Emin Muil had been bending gradually northward as they struggled on. Along its brink there now stretched a wide, tumbled flat of scored and weathered rock, cut every now and again by trench-like gullies that sloped steeply down to deep notches in the cliff face. To find a path in these clefts, which were becoming deeper and more frequent, Frodo and Sam were driven to their left, well away from the edge and they did not notice that for several miles they had been going slowly but steadily downhill. The cliff top was sinking towards the level of the lowlands. At last they were brought to a halt. The ridge took a sharper bend northward and was gashed by a deeper ravine. On the further side it reared up again, many fathoms at a single leap. A great grey cliff loomed before them, cut sheer down as if by a knife stroke. They could go no further forwards, and must turn now either west or east. But west would lead them only into more labour and delay, back towards the heart of the hills. East would take them to outer precipice. There's nothing for it but to scramble down this gully, Sam, said Frodo. Let's see what it leads to. <laughs> A nasty drop, I'll bet, said Sam. The cleft was longer and deeper than it seemed. Some way down they found a few gnarled and stunted trees, the first they had seen for days. Twisted birch for the most part, with here and there a fir tree. Many were dead and gaunt, bitten to the core by the eastern winds. Once in milder days there must have been a fair thicket in the ravine, but now, after some fifty yards, the trees came to an end. Though old broken stumps straggled on almost to the cliff's brink, the bottom of the gully, which lay along the edge of a rock vault, was rough with broken stone and slanted deeply down. When they came at last to the end of it, Frodo stooped and leaned out. Look, he said, we must have come down a long way, or else the cliff has sunk. It's much lower here than it was, and it looks easier too. Sam knelt beside him and peered reluctantly over the edge. Then he glanced up at the great cliff rising up, away on their left. <laughs> easier, he grunted. Well, I suppose it's always easier getting down than up. Those that can't fly can jump. It would be a big jump still, said Frodo. About, well... He stood for a moment, measuring it with his eyes. About eighteen fathoms, I should guess. Not more. And that's enough! said Sam. Oh, 
How I hate looking down from a height. But looking's better than climbing. All the same, said Frodo. I think we could climb here, and I think we shall have to try. S see, the rock is quite different from what it was a few miles back. It had slipped and cracked. The outer wall was indeed no longer sheer, but sloped outwards a little. It looked like a great rampart, or sea wall, whose foundations had shifted, so that its courses were all twisted and disordered, leaving great fissures and long slanting edges that were in places almost as wide as stairs. And if you were going to try and get down, we had better try it at once. It's getting dark early. I think there's a storm coming. The smoky blur of the mountains in the east was lost in a deeper blackness that was already reaching out westwards, with long arms. There was a distant mutter of thunder borne on the rising breeze. Frodo sniffed the air and looked up doubtfully at the sky. He strapped his belt outside his cloak and tightened it, and settled his light pack on his back. Then he stepped towards the edge. I'm going to try it, he said. Oh, very good said Sam gloomily. But I'm going first. You? said Frodo. What made you change your mind about climbing? I haven't changed my mind. But it's only sense. Put the one lowest as is most likely to slip. I don't want to come down atop of you and knock you off. <sighs> no sense in killing two with one foal. Before Frodo could stop him, he sat down, swung his legs over the brink, and twisted round, scrabbling with his toes for a foothold. It is doubtful if he ever did anything braver in cold blood more unwise. No, 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 no! Sam, you old ass! said Frodo. You'll kill yourself for certain going over like that without even a look to see what to make for. Come back! He took Sam under the armpits and hauled him up again. <laughs> now, now wait a bit and be patient, he said. Then he lay on the ground, leaning out and looking down. But the light seemed to be fading quickly, although the sun had not yet set. I think we could manage this, he said presently. I could at any rate. And and you could too, if you kept your head and followed me carefully. I don't know how you could be so sure, said Sam. Why, you can't see to the bottom in this light. What if you come to a place where there's nowhere to put your feet or your hands? Climb back, I suppose, said Frodo. <laughs> Easy said, objected Sam. Better to wait till morning and more light. No, not if I can help it, said Frodo with a sudden strange vehemence. I grudge every hour, every minute. I'm going down to try it out. Don't you follow me until I come back or call. Gripping the stony lip of the fall with his fingers, he let himself gently down, until when his arms were almost at full stretch, his toes found a ledge. One step down, he said, and this ledge broadens out to the right. I could stand here without a hold. I his words were cut short. The hurrying darkness, now gathering great speed, rushed up from the east and swallowed the sky. There was a dry, splitting crack of thunder right overhead. Searing lightning smote down into the hills. Then came a blast of savage wind, and with it, mingling with its roar, there came a high, shrill shriek. The hobbits had heard just a cry far away in the marsh as they fled from Hobbiton, and even there in the woods of the Shire it had frozen their blood. Out here in the waste, its terror was far greater. It pierced them with cold blades of horror and despair, stopping heart and breath. Sam fell flat on his face. Involuntarily, Frodo loosed his hold and put his hand over his head and ears. He swayed, slipped, and slithered downwards with a wailing cry. Sam heard him and crawled with an effort to the edge. Master! Master! He called. Master! He heard no answer. He found he was shaking all over, but he gathered his breath, and once again he shouted, Master! The wind seemed to blow his voice back into his throat, but as it passed, roaring up the gully and away over the hills, a faint answering cry came to his ears. All right, all right, I'm here, but I can't see. Frodo was calling with a weak voice. He was not actually very far away. He had slid and not fallen and had come up with a jolt to his feet on a wider ledge not many yards lower down. Fortunately, the rock face at this point leaned well back, and the wind had pressed him against the cliff so that he had not toppled over. He steadied himself a little, 
laying his face against the cold stone, feeling his heart pounding. But either the darkness had grown complete, or else his eyes had lost their sight. All was black around him. He wondered if he had been struck blind. He took a deep breath. Come back! Come back! He heard Sam's voice out of the blackness above. I can't! He said. I can't see! I can't find any hold! I can't move yet! What can I do, Mr. Frodo? What can I do? Shouted Sam, leaning out dangerously far. Why could not his master see? It was dim, certainly, but not as dark as all that. He could see Frodo below him. A grey, forlorn figure splayed against the cliff, but he was far out of the reach of any helping hand. There was another crack of thunder, and then the rain came, in a blinding sheet. Mingled with hail, it drove against the cliff, bitter cold. I'm coming down to you, shouted Sam, though how he hoped to help in that way he could not have said. No, no, wait! Frodo called back more strongly now. I shall be better soon, I feel better already. Wait, you can't do anything without a rope. Rope! cried Sam, talking wildly to himself in his excitement and relief. What if I don't deserve to be hung on the end of one as a warning to numbskulls? You're not but a ninny hammered, Sam Gamgee. That's what the gaffer has said to me, often enough being a word of his. Rope! Stop chattering! cried Frodo, now recovered enough to feel both amused and annoyed. Never mind your gaffer. Are you trying to tell yourself you've got some rope in your pocket? If so, out with it! Yes, Mr. Frodo. In my pack and all. Carried it hundreds of times and I had clean forgotten it. Then get busy and let an end down. Quickly Sam unslung his pack and rummaged in it. There indeed at the bottom was a coil of the silken grey rope made by the folk of Lorien. He cast an end to his master. The darkness seemed to lift from Frodo's eyes, or else his sight was returning. He could see the grey line as it came dangling down, and he thought it had a faint silver sheen. Now that he had some point in the darkness to fix his eyes on, he felt less giddy. Leaning his weight forward, he made the end fast round his waist, and then he grasped the line with both hands. Sam stepped back and raised his feet against the stump, a yard or two from the edge. Half hold, half scrambling, Frodo came up and threw himself on the ground. Thunder growled and rumbled in the distance, and the rain was still falling heavily. The hobbits crawled away back into the gully, but they did not find much shelter there. Rills of water began to run down. Soon they grew to a spate that slashed and fumed on the stones and spouted out over the cliff like the gutters of a vast roof. I should have been half drowned in here or, or, or washed clean off, said Frodo. What a piece of luck you had that rope. Better luck if I thought of it sooner, said Sam. Maybe you remember them putting the ropes in the boats as we started off in the Elvish country. I took a fancy to it, and I stowed a coil in my pack. Years ago, it seems. It may be a help in many needs, he said. Aldir. Or one of those folk. <laughs> and he spoke right. Pity I didn't think of bringing another length, said Frodo. But I left the company in such a hurry and confusion. If only we had enough, we could use it to get down. How long is your rope, I wonder? Sam paid it out slowly, measuring it with his arms. Five, ten, twenty, thirty, thirty elves, more or less, he said. Who'd have thought it? Ah, who would? Said Sam. Elves are wonderful folk. It looks a bit thin, but it's tough and soft as milk to the hand. Packs close, too, and as light as light. Wonderful folk, to be sure. Thirty elves, said Frodo, considering. I believe it would be enough if the storm passes before nightfall. I'm going to try it. The rain's nearly given over already, said Sam. But don't you go doing anything risky in the dim again, Mr. Frodo. And I haven't got over that shriek of the wind yet. If you have. Like a black rider, it sounded. But one up in the air if they can fly. I'm thinking. We'd best lay up this crack till the night's over. And I'm thinking that I won't spend a moment longer than I need. Stuck up on this edge with eyes of the dark country looking over the marshes, said Frodo. With that, he stood up and went down to the bottom of the gully again. He looked out. Clear sky was growing in the east once more. The skirts of the storm were lifting, ragged and wet, and the main battle had passed to spread its great wings over the Emin Muil, upon which the dark thought of Sauron brooded for a while. 
Thence it turned, smiting the Vale of Anduin with hail and lightning, and casting its shadow upon Minas Tirith with threat of war. Then, lowering in the mountains, and gathering its great spires, it rolled on slowly over Gondor and the skirts of Rohan, until far away the rivers of the plain saw its black towers moving behind the sun as they rode into the west. But here, over the desert and the reeking marshes, the deep blue sky of evening opened once more, and a few pallid stars appeared, like small white holes in the canopy above the crescent moon. It's good to be able to see again, said Frodo, breathing deep. Do you know, I thought for a bit that I had lost my sight, from the lightning or something else worse. I could see nothing, nothing at all, until the grey rope came down. It seemed to shimmer somehow. It does look sort of silver in the dark, said Sam. Never noticed it before, though I can't remember as I've ever had it out since I first stowed it. But if you're so set on climbing, Mr. Frodo, how are you going to use it? Thirty L's or, say, about eighteen fathom. That's more than your guess at the height of the cliff. Frodo thought for a while. Make it fast to that stump, Sam, he said. Then I think you shall have your wish this time and go first. I'll lower you, and you need do no more than use your feet and hands to fend yourself off the rock. Though if you put your weight on some of the ledges and give me a rest, I will help. When you're down, I'll follow. I feel quite myself again now. Very well, said Sam heavily. If it must be, then let's get it over. He took up the rope and made it fast over the stump nearest to the brink. Then the other end he tied about his own waist. Reluctantly, he turned and prepared to go over the edge a second time. It did not, however, turn out half as bad as he had expected. The rope seemed to give him confidence, though he shut his eyes more than once when he looked down between his feet. There was one awkward spot, where there was no ledge, and the wall was sheer and even undercut for a short space. There he slipped and swung out on the silver line, but Frodo lowered him slowly and steadily and it was over at last. His chief fear had been that the rope length would give out while he was still high up, but there was still a good bite in Frodo's hands. When Sam came to the bottom and called up, I'm down. his voice came up clearly from below, but Frodo could not see him. His grey elven cloak had melted into the twilight. Frodo took rather more time to follow him, but he did not want to risk a fall, and he had not quite Sam's faith in this slender grey line. He found two places all the same, where he had to trust wholly to it, smooth surfaces where there was no hold even for his strong hobbit fingers and the ledges were far apart. But at last he too was down. Well, he cried, we've done it. We've escaped from the Emin Muil. And now what next, I wonder? Maybe we shall soon be sighing for good hard rock underfoot again. But Sam did not answer. He was staring back up the cliff. Oh, ninny hammers! He said, Noodles! My beautiful rope! There it is tied to a stump, but we were at the bottom just as nice a little stair for that slinking golem as we could leave. Better put up a signpost to say which way we've gone. I thought it seemed a bit too easy. If you can think of any way we could have both used the rope and yet brought it down with us, then you can pass on to me the ninny hammer, or any other name your gaffer gave you, said Frodo. Climb up and untie it and let yourself down if you want to. Sam scratched his head. Oh, I can't think of how, begging your pardon, he said. But I don't like leaving it, and that's a fact. He stroked the rope's end and shook it gently. It goes hard parting with anything I brought out of the elf country. Maybe by Gladriel herself too, maybe. Gladriel, he muttered, nodding his head mournfully. He looked up and gave one last pull to the rope, as if in farewell. To the complete surprise of both the hobbits, it came loose. Sam fell over, and the long grey coils slithered silently down on top of him. Frodo laughed. <laughs> Who tied a rope? He said. A good thing it held as long as it did. Whew, to think that I trusted all my weight to your knot. Sam did not laugh. <sighs> I may not be much good at climbing, Mr. Frodo. He said in injured tones. But I do know something about rope and about knots. It's in the family, as you might say. Why, my granddad and my uncle Andy after him, 
That was the guy for Zelda's brother. He had a rope walkover by Typefield many a year. And I put as fast a hitch over the stump as anyone could have done in the Shire or out of it. Then the rope must have broken. Frayed on the rock edge, I expect. Said Frodo. I bet it didn't! Said Sam in an even more injured voice. He stooped and examined the ends. Nor has it neither. Not a strand. Then I'm afraid it must have been the knot, said Frodo. Sam shook his head and did not answer. He was passing the rope through his fingers thoughtfully. <sighs> have it your way, Mr. Frodo, he said at last. But I think the rope came off itself when I called. He called it up and stowed it lovingly in his pack. It certainly came, said Frodo. And that's the chief thing. <sighs> but now we've got to think of our next move. Night will be on us soon. How beautiful the stars are. And the moon. They do cheer the heart, don't they? Said Sam, looking up. I wish they are, somehow. And the moon's growing. We haven't seen him for a night or two in this cloudy weather. He's beginning to give quite a light. Yes said Frodo. But he won't be full for some days. I don't think we'll try the marshes by the light of half a moon. Under the first shadows of night, they started out on the next stage of their journey. After a while, Sam turned and looked back at the way they had come. The mouth of the gully was a black notch in the dim cliff. Oh, I'm glad we got the rope, he said. We've set a little puzzle for that footpad anyhow. He can try his nasty flappy feet on those ledges. They picked their steps away from the skirts of the cliff, among a wilderness of boulders and rough stones, wet and slippery with the heavy rain. The ground still fell away sharply. They had not gone very far when they came upon a great fissure that yawned suddenly black before their feet. It was not wide, but it was too wide to jump across it in the dim light. They thought they could hear water gurgling in its depths. It curved away from their left northward, back towards the hills and so barred their road in that direction. At any rate, while darkness lasted. Well, we had better try a way back southwards along the line of the cliff, I think, said Sam. We might find some nook there, or even a cave or something. I suppose so, said Frodo. But I'm tired, and I don't think I can scramble among stones much longer tonight. Though I grudge the delay, I wish there was a clear path in front of us. Then I'd go on till my legs gave way. They did not find the going any easier at the broken feet of the Emin wheel, nor did Sam find any nook or hollow to shelter in. Only bare stony slopes frowned over by the cliff, which now rose again, higher and more sheer as they went back. In the end, worn out, they just cast themselves on the ground under the lee of a boulder lying not far from the foot of the precipice. There, for some time, they sat huddled mournfully together in the cold, stormy night, while sleep crept up upon them in spite of all they could do to hold it off. The moon now rode high and clear. Its thin white light lit up the faces of the rocks and drenched the cold, frowning walls of the cliff, turning all the wide, looming darkness into a chill, pale grey, scored with black shadows. <sighs> well said Frodo, standing up and drawing his cloak more closely around him. You sleep for a bit, Sam, and take my blanket. I'll walk up and down for sentry for a while. Suddenly he stiffened, and stooping he gripped Sam by the arm. <sighs> What's that? he whispered. Look over there on the cliff. Sam looked and breathed in sharply through his teeth. <sighs> he said, That's what it is. Is that Gollum? Snakes and adders. And to think that I thought that we'd puzzle it with our bit of a climb. Oh, look at him. Like a nasty crawling spider on a wall. Down the face of a precipice. Sheer and almost smooth it seemed in the pale moonlight. A small black shape was moving with its thin limbs splayed out. Maybe its soft clinging hands and tones were finding crevices and holes that no hobbit could ever have seen or used. But it looked as if it was just creeping down on sticky paths. 
like some large prowling thing of insect kind. And it was coming down head first, as if it was smelling its way. Now and again it lifted its head slowly, turning it right back on its long skinny neck, and the hobbits caught a glimpse of two small, pale, gleaming lights, its eyes that blinked at the moon for a moment, and then were quickly lidded again. How do you think he can see us? said Sam. I don't know, said Frodo quietly, but I think not. It's hard even for friendly eyes to see these elven cloaks. I cannot see you in the shadow even at a few paces, and I've heard that he doesn't like sun or moon. Then why is he coming down just here? asked Sam. Quietly, Sam, said Frodo. He can smell us, perhaps, and he can hear as keen as elves, I believe. I think he has heard something now. Our voices probably. sick of him, said Sam. He's come once too often for me, and I'm going to have a word with him if I can. I don't suppose we could give him the slip now, anyway. Drawing his grey hood well over his face, Sam crept stealthily towards the cliff. Careful, whispered Frodo, coming behind. <laughs> don't alarm him. He's much more dangerous than he looks. The black, crawling shape was now three quarters of the way down and perhaps fifty feet or less above the cliff's foot. Crouching stone still in the shadow of a large boulder, the hobbits watched him. He seemed to have come to a difficult passage, or to be troubled about something. They could hear him snuffling, and now and again there was a harsh hiss of breath that sounded like a curse. He lifted his head, and they thought they heard him spit. Then he moved on again. Now they could hear his voice creaking and whistling. He lifted his head again, blinked at the moon, and quickly shut his eyes. He hissed. He was getting lower now, and the hisses became sharper and clearer. Sam. And what's his precious? Does he mean Shh. Breathe, Frodo. He's getting near now. Near enough to hear a whisper. Indeed, Gollum had suddenly paused again, and his large head on his scrawny neck was lolling from side to side, as if he was listening. His pale eyes were half unlidded. Sam restrained himself, though his fingers were twitching. His eyes, filled with anger and disgust, were fixed on the wretched creature as he now began to move again, still whispering and hissing to himself. At last he was no more than a dozen feet from the ground, right above their heads. From that point there was a sheer drop, for the cliff was slightly undercut, and even Gollum could not find a hold of any kind. He seemed to be trying to twist round, so as to go legs first, when suddenly, with a shrill, whistling shriek, he fell, and as he did so, he killed his legs and arms up round him, like a spider whose descending thread is snapped. Sam was out of his hiding in a flash and crossed the space between him and the cliff foot in a couple of leaps. Before Gollum could get up, 
He was on top of it, but he found rather more than he bargained for, even taken like that suddenly off his guard after a fall. Before Sam could get a hold, long legs and arms wound around him, binning his arms. And a clinging grip, soft but horribly strong, was squeezing him like slowly tightening cords. Clammy fingers were feeling for his throat. Then sharp teeth bit into his shoulder. All he could do was to butt his hard round head sideways to the creature's face. Gollum hissed and spat, but he did not let go. Things would have gone ill with Sam if he had been alone. But Frodo sprang up and drew Sting from his sheath. With his left hand, he drew back Gollum's head by his thin, lank hair, stretching his long neck and forcing his pale, venomous eyes to stare up at the sky. Let go, Gollum! He said. <sighs> this is Sting. You have seen it before once upon a time. Let go, or you'll feel it this time. I'll cut your throat. Gollum collapsed and went as loose as a wet string. Sam got up, fingering his shoulder, his eyes smoldering with anger, but he could not avenge himself. His miserable enemy lay groveling on the stones, whimpering. Turn torches! Don't let them hurt us, precious! They won't hurt us, will they? Nice hobbitses! We didn't pull no harm, but the jumps on us like cats on poor bosses. They're dead precious, and we're so lonely. Gollum, Gollum, we'll be nice to them and they be nice to us, won't we? Yes, yes. But what's to be done with him? said Sam. Tie him up so he can't come sneaking after us. No more, I say. Well, that would kill us. Kill us. <sighs> Whimpered Gollum. Come on, little hobbits. Tie us up in the cold hard lands and leave us. Gollum. 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 <laughs> Sobs welled up in his gobbling throat. No, said Frodo. If we kill him, we must kill him outright. We can't do that. Not as things are. Poor wretch. He has done us no harm. Oh, hasn't he? Said Sam, rubbing his shoulder. Anyway, he meant to. And he means to. I'll roar it. Throttle us in our sleep. That's his plan. I dare say, said Frodo. But what he means to do is another matter. He paused for a while in thought. Gollum lay still, but stopped whimpering. Sam stood glowering over him. It seemed to Frodo then that he heard, quite plainly but far off, voices out of the past. What a pity that Bilbo did not stab the vile creature when he had the chance. Pity. Pity and mercy. Not so strike without need. I do not feel any pity for Gollum. He deserves death. Deserves it? I dare say he does. Many that live deserve death, and some that die deserve life. Can you give it to them? And do not be too eager to deal out death and judgment, for even the very wise cannot see all ends. Very well, he answered aloud, lowering his sword. But still, I am afraid. And yet, as you see, I will not touch the creature. For now that I see him, I do pity him. Sam stared at his master, who seemed to be speaking to someone who was not there. Gollum lifted his head. Yes, yes, what we are, precious, he whined. Misery, misery, hobbits won't kill us, no, nice hobbits. No, we won't, said Frodo, but we won't let you go either. You're full of wickedness and mischief, Gollum. You will have to come with us, that's all, while we keep an eye on you. But you must help us if you can. One good turn deserves another. Yes! Yes, indeed! Nice hobbits! We will come with them! Find them safe paths in the dark! Yes, we will! Where are they going in these cold, hard lands, we wonders? Yes, we wonders! He looked up at them, and a faint light of cunning and eagerness flickered for a second in his pale, blinking eyes. Sam scowled at him and sucked his teeth. 
but he seemed to sense that there was something odd about his master's mood, and that the master was beyond argument. All the same, he was amazed at Frodo's reply. Frodo looked straight into Gollum's eyes, which flinched and twisted away. You know that, or you guess well enough, Smeagol, he said, quiet and sternly. We are going to Mordor, of course, and you know the way there, I believe. <coughs> said Gollum, covering his ears with his hands, as if such frankness and the open speaking of the names hurt him. We didn't want them to go to go. No, precious, not the Norris Hobbits. Ashes, ashes, and dust, and floss there is, and pits, 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 and rocks, thousands of rocks. Norris Hobbits must go to Norris Hobbits. So you have been there, Frodo insisted. And you're being drawn back there, aren't you? Yes. Yes. No! Treat Gollum. Once by accident, wasn't it precious? Yes, yes, by accident. But we won't go back. No! No! Then suddenly his voice and language changed and he sobbed in his throat and spoke but not to them. to come back. I can find it. I am tired. I will can't find it. Tell him. Tell him. No. No. They're always weak. Dwarfs. Men. Elves. Terrible elves. With bright eyes. I can't find it. <gasps> He got up and clenched his long hand into a bony fleshless knot, shaking it towards the east. We won't! He cried. Not for you! Then he collapsed again. He whimpered with his face to the ground. Don't look at us! Go away! Go to sleep! He will not go away or go to sleep at your command, Smeagol. But if you really wish to be free of him again, then you must help me. And that I fear means finding us a path towards it. But you need not go all the way. Not beyond the gates of this land. He's over there! He cackled. Over there! Orcs will take you all the way. Easy to find orcs east of the river. Don't ask Smeagol. Poor, poor Smeagol. He went away long ago. They took us precious, and he's lost now. Perhaps we'll find him again, if you come with us, said Frodo. No, no, never. He lost his precious, said Gollum. Get up, said Frodo. Gollum stood up and backed away against the cliff. Now, said Frodo, can you find a path easier by day or by night? We're tired, but if you choose the night, we'll start tonight. The big light hearts are all they do. Gollum whined. Not under the white face. Not yet. It will go behind the hill soon. Yes. Rest be first, nice hobbits. Then sit down, said Frodo, and don't move. The hobbits seated themselves beside him, one on either side with their backs to the stony wall, resting their legs. There was no need for any arrangement by word. They knew that they must not sleep for a moment. Slowly the moon went by, shadows fell down from the hills, and all drew dark before them. The stars grew thick and bright in the sky above. No one stirred. Gollum sat with his legs drawn up, knees under chin, flat hands and feet splayed to the ground, his eyes closed, but he seemed tense, as if thinking or listening. Frodo looked across at Sam. Their eyes met and they understood. They relaxed, 
leaning their heads back and shutting their eyes, or seeming so. Soon the sound of their soft breathing could be heard. Gollum's hands twitched a little. Hardly perceptibly, his head moved to the left and the right, and first one eye and then another opened a slit. The hobbits made no sign. Suddenly, with startling agility and speed, straight off the ground with a jump like a grasshopper or a frog, Gollum bounded forward into the darkness. But that was just what Frodo and Sam had expected. Sam was on him before he had gone two paces after his spring. Frodo, coming behind him, grabbed his leg and threw him. Your rope might prove useful again, Sam, he said. Sam got out the rope. And where were you off in the cold hard lands, Mr. Gollum? He growled. We wonders, aye, we wonders, to find some of your old friends, I'll warrant. You nasty, treacherous creature. It's round your neck this rope ought to go to. A tight noose, too. Gollum lay quiet and tried no further tricks. He did not answer Sam, but gave him a swift, venomous look. All we need is something to keep a hold of him, said Frodo. We want him to walk, so it's no good tying his legs or his arms. He seems to use them nearly as much. Tie one end to his ankle, and keep a grip on the other end. He stood over Gollum while Sam tried the knot. The result surprised them both. Gollum began to scream, a thin, tearing sound very horrible to hear. He writhed and tried to get his mouth to his ankle and bite the rope. He kept on screaming. At last, Frodo was convinced that he really was in pain, but it could not be from the knot. He examined it and found that it was not too tight, indeed hardly tight enough. Sam was gentler than his words. What's the matter with you? He said. If you will try to run away, you must be tied. We don't wish to hurt you. It hurts us! Hissed Gollum. It freezes! It bites! I've twisted it! Curse them! Nasty cruel habits! That's why we tried to escape! Of course it is, precious! Because they were cruel habits, they vision elves, fierce elves with bright eyes. Take it off us! It us! No, I will not take it off you, said Frodo. Not unless... He paused a moment and thought. Not unless there is any promise you can make that I can trust. <laughs> we will swear to do what he wants. Yes. Yes, said Gollum, still twisting and grabbling at his ankle. It hurts us. It hurts us. Swear, said Frodo. Smeagol, said Gollum suddenly and clearly, opening his eyes wide and staring at Frodo with a straight light. Smeagol, we swear. precious. Frodo drew himself up and again Sam was startled by his words and his stern voice. On the precious? How dare you? Think! One ring to rule them all and in the darkness bind them. Would you commit your promise to that, Smeagol? It will hold you, but it is more treacherous than you are. It may twist your words. Beware! Gollum cowered. <laughs> On the precious! On the precious! He repeated. And what would you swear? Asked Frodo. Be very, very good, said Gollum. Then, crawling to Frodo's feet, he groveled before him, whispering hoarsely. A shudder ran over him, as if the words shook his very bones with fear. <laughs> never, never to let him have it. Never. Never. <laughs> The precious. No! Not on it! said Frodo, looking down at him with stern pity. All you wish is to see and to touch it if you can, though you know it would drive you mad. Not on it. Swear by it if you will, for you know where it is. Yes, you know, Smeagol. It is before you! For a moment it appeared to Sam that his master had grown and then Gollum had shrunk. A tall, stern shadow, a mighty lord who hid his brightness in grey cloud, and at his feet a little whining dog. Yet the two were in some way akin and not alien. 
they could reach one another's minds. Gollum raised himself and began pawing at Frodo, fawning at his knees. Down! Down! said Frodo. Now speak your promise. He promises. Yes, I promise, said Gollum. I will serve the master of the precious. Good master. Good sweetheart. Gollum! Gollum! Suddenly he began to weep and bite at his ankle again. Take the rope off, Sam, said Frodo. Reluctantly, Sam obeyed. At once, Gollum got up and began prancing about, like a whipped cur whose master has patted it. From that moment, a change, which lasted for some time, came over him. He spoke with less hissing and whining, and he spoke to his companions direct, not to his precious self. He would cringe and flinch if they stepped near him or made any sudden movement, and he avoided the touch of their elven cloaks. But he was friendly, and indeed pitifully anxious to please. He would cackle with laughter and caper if any jest was made, or even if Frodo spoke kindly to him, and weep if Frodo rebuked him. Sam said little to him of any sort. He suspected him more deeply than ever, and if possible, liked the new Gollum, the Smeagol, less than the old. Well, Gollum, or whatever it is where, where, where to call you, he said. Now for it! The moon's gone, and the night's going. We'd better start. Yes, yes! Agreed Gollum, uh, uh, skipping about. Off we go! There's only one way across between the north end and the south end. I found it. I did. Orcs don't use it. Orcs don't know it. <laughs> Orcs don't cross the marshes. They go around for miles and miles. Very lucky you found this one. Very lucky you found Small Girl. Follow Small Girl. He took a few steps away and looked back inquiringly, like a dog inviting them for a walk. Wait a bit, Gollum! cried Sam. Not too far ahead now. I'm going to beat your tail, and I've got the rope handy. No, no! said Gollum. Smell your promise! In the deep of night, under hard, clear stars, they set off. Gollum led them back northward for a while along the way they had come. Then he slanted to the right, away from the steep edge of the Emin Wuyil, down the broken stony slopes towards the vast ferns below. They faded swiftly and softly into the darkness, over all the leagues of waste before the gates of Mordor, there was a black silence.